Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the final plenary session of today. Warm welcome to our speaker, Professor David Josky. We'd like to acknowledge that today's plenary session is proudly sponsored by St. John of God Subiaco, so thank you to them for their generous and ongoing support. Hi, everybody. Um, I don't think I've had a video introduction before, ever. Um, I want to thank Emily and the conveners for asking, giving me the chance to talk to you today. Um, and Emily thought of the title, Why the Body Without the Mind. There are so many things I want to talk to you today on that topic. I can't talk about all of them. Um, I can reassure you that I don't have my wife in the audience. <laughs> um, right, green for go. So what I'm going to do is, on the one hand, tell you my own story, my professional and at times personal story, um, and out of that becomes a second story of the Solaris Care Foundation and what that's about. And in telling you the story about the Solaris Care Foundation, um, that really brought me head to head with the great schism that we have between mainstream medicine and alternative and complementary medicine. And so I'll spend some time talking about some of the great traditions and reasons for this. So all of that is a vehicle for me to kind of, if I had the chance to talk to myself in year 12 before I started medicine and say this is some things that will be really useful to know before you start. Along the way, we'll talk about tomatoes, um, René Descartes, Hippocrates, and Captain Kirk. So lots to do. Um, I went to school locally, and I did medicine at UWA a long time ago now. My father was the dean of the medical school. He was professor of medicine at Sir Charles Gardner Me uh, Hospital. He was a gruff disciplinarian, great father. Uh, and of course, that made me a marked man, particularly in the surgical chutes. And so I'd go into the chutes and the surgeon would say, ah, so you're Josky's boy, are you? Tell me the characteristics of a palpable spleen. Um, and so I had to kind of make sure that my game was high enough to not embarrass my father. Teaching moment, moves downwards immediately with respiration, dull to percussion unlike the kidney, has a notch and you can't get above it. Okay, so now you know about spleens. Um, it's fair to say that um, the first of three personal crises in medicine occurred in fifth year, which was our specialties year then. And I really felt like I wasn't connecting with medicine. I felt like when I went to clinics and attended ward rounds that I was just a supernumerary hanger-on that was not welcome at all. I now know that that was wrong, and I'll tell you why later on. After graduating, I did some terms up in Port Hedland, and um, whilst I'm pictured there with a cuddly little baby, I vividly remember a case of a young Aboriginal man who progressively died of multi-organ failure despite every set of numbers looking normal. And I can't explain that. I do know that he'd had the bone pointed, uh, or there's probably a better way of phrasing that, uh, and he basically died of self-belief that he had to die. And I can't explain that, but that was one of the first encounters I had with what you might tritely call the power of the mind. Uh, I discovered music. The top photo is an early version of my band called DJ and the Discharge at the time, playing at the third year medical student dinner. And in the bottom photo, my colleagues and I were winning the Australian Medical Students Convention um, Talent Night with a politically extremely incorrect version of Mull of Kintyre, uh, of which I can't even tell you the name. It would be inappropriate here. Um, in 1985, well, let's go back a step. So 1984, my second year out is when I clicked with medicine, and only then. And I realise in retrospect it's because I'm the kind of person that reacts well to responsibility. And as a student, I felt that I didn't have any, and therefore I felt I didn't need to be there. And I had some great teachers in that year, 
and I realised belatedly that we do stuff to people and you can measure it and be a good or bad doctor on, depending on what interventions you pick. And one of the hallmarks of a good doctor versus a bad doctor is picking good markers of disease, usually the patient's own understanding of their illness. In 1985, I did a kind of a gap year. I was very interested in emergency and expedition medicine. Uh, did six months at the old Royal Infirmary in Edinburgh. A lot of ghosts in that building. Um, and then I joined a volunteer group and built a school in the jungle in South America for three months. Um, they put me in charge of one of the groups. So I was in charge of about 25 high-powered people from around the world and a whole lot of were well, a small number of British um, soldiers who were pretty tough characters to manage. And it taught me an awful lot about myself as a manager, which prepared me much better than anything else possibly could have for becoming a line manager as a registrar in hospital medicine the next year. Uh, I vividly remember doing some house calls up and down the river in a pecky pecky, one of the little boats, and treating a young girl with a uh, an ulcer, an ulcer on the top of her head that was down to periosteum and telling the family to give this child, in my best Spanish, two teaspoons of penicillin every day. Came back the next day, or two days later, firstly I was chased by the family bull because I was wearing the wrong colour shirt, very humbling experience, and secondly, also humbling, I learned that they'd been tipping the penicillin on the child's head rather than getting her to swallow it. And actually, I realised that this girl's main diagnosis was that she was an orphan and nobody was really prepared to buy into her care. These days we would call that the social determinants of medicine. So back, I did my haematology, my physician's exam, got depressed after I passed, didn't know what to do, eventually chose haematology because it seemed like a nice, well-ordered body of knowledge, did my training and then went to Shuv in Lausanne in Switzerland, made myself speak French all day in the lab. Uh, that's the building. Like every Swiss hospital, there are three floors underground for the military that nobody gets to see. And that's the view out the lab window, looking up Lake Geneva towards the upper Rhone Valley. So two years in Switzerland, um, pure research job. I learnt in that position about the different feedback cycles in medicine. So in outpatient medicine, primary care, the feedback cycle is usually weeks. You start a patient on a diuretic, within 48 hours or six or seven days, you hope that there's a response. In acute hospital medicine, the feedback cycle, for example, in ICU is as quick as six or 12 hours. In research, your feedback cycle to get a positive stroke back from what you've done in terms of setting up an experiment can be as long as six months. And you have to be prepared to be ready for that if you take up pure research. I was pining for clinical medicine. I took a job at the Hammersmith Hospital in London. Uh, it's moved now. This is a very famous old facade, very famous hospital, the Royal Postgraduate Medical School. It's regarded as the birthplace of haematology because of the founders of the discipline being based there. Um, and if you look at the original version of the movie, The Italian Job, Michael Caine is driving past this facade at the very start of the movie because next door to it was the famous Wormwood Scrubs prison. And equally famously, a, one um, prisoner escaped by running out and hiding in the hospital for a couple of days. Something I wish I probably could have done at times. At this stage, I had offers of jobs in London and in Melbourne. Um, but I accepted a job back in Perth as head of department of haematology as my first consultant job and set about trying to build an academic department. Um, and largely, I think I can say uh, we succeeded. I started the hospital's bone marrow transplant program. We did the world first autologous transplant for rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, I treated the first person in Western Australia with a drug called Gleevec for chronic myeloid leukaemia, one of the first targeted therapies in 1999. Her name is Catherine um, and she has two children now and we catch up socially. Um, we participate in clinical trials with the Australian Leukaemia and Lymphoma Group 
into all of the haematological malignancies. We've treated over 350 patients and give them access to a whole lot of the new targeted therapies. And I tell you all of this to make it clear that I'm a mainstream cancer doctor. I believe and know how chemotherapy works. I give it with the best of them. And yet, I had a sense of dis dissatisfaction as a young consultant that we were making a meal of how we treat people with cancer. Delays to the first appointment with patients incredibly distressed. Long delays between the first review and starting treatment. Poor communication and distress with relatives um, and so on. Most of it coming back to issues of communication. And in 1999, I had a kind of road to Damascus moment. Uh, Roy was a patient of mine with follicular lymphoma. I use the past tense not because he's dead, but because he's cured. And that's actually not supposed to happen. So that's another mind over body thing, perhaps. About um, oh, two or three months into his treatment, Roy said to me that it had taken him three months to learn how to be a patient. And I said, what do you mean? And he said, well, I had to learn the terminology of my disease. I had to learn the geography of the hospital, and all hospitals are rabbit warrens, of course. Um, I had to learn all about my treatment, and then the phrase that stuck in my mind was, I had to learn who I could talk to about what I was doing to help myself. What do you mean by that, Roy? And he said, well, we all sit out there in the waiting room, and we'll talk to each other, and we'll say, have you tried shark cartilage? Have you tried late trial? Have you tried the Noni bush juice from Geraldton. Um, have you tried this or that? And for heaven's sake, don't tell Dr. X or Nurse Y because they'll poo-poo you for doing all that alternative stuff. Or worse, and I have heard of instances of patients being refused treatment because they were following their beliefs. And the thing that made my head turn around was that firstly, 40 to 70% of cancer patients in just about every nation surveyed will be trying these sorts of things. And that secondly, as their doctor, either I had to buy into this issue and be prepared to show an open mind or forever have a barrier between me and my patients. As a physician, in the wider sense of the word, that was not acceptable. And so I started reading up on complementary and alternative medicine with an open mind and um, it's fair to say, in all of this journey, I've gone from feeling like a doctor who had to show an open mind to being a doctor with an open mind. They're not quite the same thing. And I found more evidence that I e expected, admittedly in the lower impact factor journals, um, in favour of a number of complementary therapies, mostly massage and touch-based interventions. Good clinical studies show Acupuncture is particularly good for um, chemotherapy-induced nausea, particularly when it involves the P6 pressure point on the left wrist, for example. Turns out music therapy is very good for depression and poor mood and reduces length of stay in bone marrow transplant patients in a good study done in Seattle. Massage generally, it turns out, is particularly effective for anxiety. And then through a chance contact with a patient's relative who was on a board, of a company, they came to me and said, we'd like to have a community campaign and do something, what do you suggest? And I said, well, I'd like to build a cancer support centre. And so uh, I went on telly with a great deal of reluctance. Uh, it was Brown's Milk, and um, I'm there as a talking head. It took five hours to film for a 30-second ad, um, with the director saying, be bigger, be bigger. Uh, which is something I have achieved since. Um, and this thing, the company said they'd give five cents for every litre of milk sold. And the PR guys in the company said my life would never be the same. Um, and I was very reluctant because doctors don't do that kind of thing. And my life didn't really change. I was recognised once at the Qantas check-in. The lady said, oh, you're the milk guy, aren't you? Um, and for about two years, all of the kids at my daughter's primary school thought I was a milkman. 
Um, but actually, apart from that, because the content of the ad was very much aimed at getting our cancer support centre going, the reception was very positive. We opened on this day, and from that day to this, it's been about 100 miles an hour, reflecting a huge community demand. And the Solaris Centre's function, firstly, as a kind of quiet oasis. Um, people can come in and have a cup of tea. We have meet and greet staff who are not professionals. They might be retired farmers, professors of chemistry, medical students, lawyers, all sorts. Uh, secondly, we have a lot of information of the various cancer support organisations. And then thirdly, we offer a range of selected complementary therapies. And the ones that I picked were the ones that I felt I was comfortable with and that I could have some kind of clinical dialogue with um, about patient outcomes. When we put the ads in the paper, uh, people applied saying they'd like to hang crystals over the patient's chemotherapy bag. I felt like I couldn't have a clinical dialogue with that style of therapy. The most controversial things we picked were hands-off massage with Reiki, um, and I can tell you some wonderful stories about that, but I won't go into that here. Um, around about 2005, I had my second professional crisis of confidence because I realised that we needed to become a standalone foundation and form a board, and I suddenly felt like I was committing myself to a very public, locked-in role, uh, and did I really want to be that um, pin-up boy for the alternative medicine mu movement, if you want to call it that. And eventually I decided after um, a rough time that I would follow my moral compass and do what felt right to me, and if others chose to follow, well, that's up to them and all well and good. And so we did become a foundation in 2006, renamed ourselves as the Solaris Cancer Care, formed a chemo club at a gym, um, exercise classes for cancer patients, a second centre at St John of God Hospital in Subiaco, a third centre in Bunbury where mainstream cancer services were being ramped up, a fourth centre in Albany, and now we have a fifth centre by amalgamating with a cancer support association in Cottesloe, which is more an outpatient based thing. At the time, this was an incredibly radical notion to put these sorts of complementary and alternative therapies within a teaching hospital and give patients access to them. And I spent the first 18 months after we started terrified that the head of medical oncology would come in and say, your therapist's been telling my patients not to have chemotherapy. And so we had to have do's and don'ts for the therapist. We had to make sure there was no risk for a very vulnerable group of people, and we succeeded. One of our um, fundraising ventures is the Red Sky Ride. I've done it twice. It's about 1,000 kilometres in a week. That photo's been digitally altered to make it look as if I'm enjoying myself. <laughs> um, it's a killer. So long story short, after 15 years, we have one of the biggest volunteer organisations in Western Australia. We deliver 700 treatments a month. We've treated over now 12,000 people with cancer in Western Australia and their carers. We've had no medical misadventure and we've enjoyed community acceptance with the Health Department Excellence Award and, sorry, community acceptance with the Social Entrepreneur of the Year Award for myself, but really by definition for the whole thing and a Department of Health Excellence Award. Soon after we started, there was pushback. This might surprise some of you because things have changed down the track, but at the time, I had a letter from a surgeon that I used to do final year examining with. Very concerned. I found my patients being confronted with alternative medical approaches, quackery in various guises, a denial of the medical school, no supportive evidence, and so on. I was nominated for a Ben Spoon Award by the Australian Skeptics Association for, quote, the most preposterous piece of pseudoscientific piffle. Um, and I had to live with that. Um, when I had this kind of response from people, I would write back and say, well, this is the evidence. We're not claiming cures. We're addressing cancer symptoms and treatment side effects. And there is some evidence, and we're going to continue to do research. Um, and generally, when I did that and when I spoke to departments and to individuals, people started to see what we were trying to achieve. The reason for the antipathy is the mind and body split. And this started in 1641 with René Descartes. And his treatise is subtitled The Distinction Between Mind and Body Are Demonstrated. And he started the whole Western scientific tradition. 
And so from his time, we've had this split. As another example, in 1910, the US government commissioned the Flexner Report because they were concerned about a lot of dodgy medical schools starting up. And the conclusion of the report was that only those medical schools that taught a physical basis for disease should be supported by government. Very influential in the US where about half of the medical schools collapsed, less so in the UK and therefore Australia. So we have a clash of cultures. On the one hand, mainstream medicine, we're very biotechnological, hypothesis testing. We use a population standards-based and reductionist approach to get quantitative outcomes. And treatment is usually defined by the disease characteristics. In the complementary medical world, it's holistic, it's qualitative, it's individualised, it's explorative, and there's this concept of energy that can be channeled to improve healing from which, in my experience, doctors run a mile. One of the agendas I have for my organisation is to start getting a dialogue happening between these two areas of healthcare. And so we're moving now, thankfully, back to getting the mind and body together again. The old traditional model of cancer care is cut, burn or poison the tumour. But nowadays we know that some of these variables like mood and personality affect immune function and we can use the immune system as immunotherapy for cancer. And there are some incredible examples coming through in clinical trials which we're involved in at the moment. So this is referred to as psychoneuroimmunology. And just to give you three examples, I've shown that people who have the stress of caring for somebody who's chronically unwell have blunted responses to vaccines, they have impaired wound healing, um, a Cochrane analysis, yoga versus no therapy in breast cancer women, uh, yoga improves health-related quality of life. Um, and singing has been demonstrated to have good effects upon blood cortisol, mood, and a whole lot of cytokine changes as well. Um, this energy thing is confronting. It's not in Western religion. It's not in any of the exams that you'll sit now or later on. Um, and yet, we can talk about the energy in a room we can talk about um, acupuncture is based on the Chinese concept of lines of energy in a body. Um, and my own belief is that this energy thing is immune function. So problems with cancer treatment. And now I'm getting back to a uh, more personal side of things, I guess. These are some of the things that I perceived. And so I made some changes in the way I conduct myself in medicine. One was to start Solaris Care, obviously. But a second and crucial one was to redraw the line. I'd been told that if you go into cancer medicine, you have to get not too involved. You have to stand back, otherwise you'll burn out. Um, after six or seven years as a consultant, I felt that that wasn't the right approach for me. And so I metaphorically removed the white coat and let myself befriend patients if it's happening. Um, it's not something every patient is comfortable with. It's certainly not something every doctor is comfortable with. It means that sometimes I lose friends rather than patients. But for me, it works best. It means I can just be myself at work without worrying about artificially whether I'm being the right version of a doctor. The photo there is a picture I took on a tiger hunt on the back of an elephant when I was 19. It's framed and in my consulting room and I look at it before I start clinic just to remind me to put the artifice of what I've learnt to one side and be a person first and doctor second, because that works best for me. I made some practical changes. I restructured my clinic so patients could have more time. I do the bad news session twice, because people recall little on the first time and so on. So I just want to digress from worrying about the patient's minds to our own minds and the issues of burnout and self-care. Burnout is not fatigue, it's not depression. It overlaps with them, particularly with fatigue. But the hallmarks of burnout are exhaustion, a sense of alienation or worthlessness or cynicism about the value of the work you are doing, and impaired performance, which typically starts manifesting first in the little things, not the big things. We know now that junior doctors and medical students can burn out. It's not something that's a function of longevity in the job. The treatment for 
burnout. These are some personal suggestions. For the reasons that I've said, settle on your own style as the doctor. Don't be afraid to listen to those around you and heed their advice. A third crisis for me was about five years ago when my wife said, I think you're starting to burn out. Um, and I made some changes uh, and listened to what people were saying around me. Don't be afraid to seek help. Create a support group. In my intern year, I was getting absolutely hammered on, ta on take at Royal Perth. Um, I'll share with you that I had a terrifying dream. I was running across an open field and somebody was machine gunning me. And I woke up in a pool of sweat and terrified. Um, and we had a group of us who were meeting just to talk about work. Um, somebody in that group was a social worker with an interest in Jung and she said, why don't you draw the dream? So I drew the dream and there it was, I realised it's work. Work was killing me. Uh, and one of the things I did in response to that, good piece of advice, was learn a relaxation technique that I can do on the spot. If I get three pages in a row and there's a whole lot of people yelling at me, I can just kind of take 30 seconds and get back on top of how I'm feeling and avoid that feeling of panic. So I encourage you now and through your careers to create support groups for each other. The antidote to alienation and cynicism is a sense of gratitude. And so I, I encourage you to cultivate a sense of joy and gratitude, take holidays, and then finally, maintain or develop interests outside medicine, particularly creative. Um, this is me with uh, my band on a fundraiser. Um, this is a quote from a really wonderful paper by uh, Christine Davies and colleagues where they used a simple phone survey which included questionnaires or instruments to measure people's mental health. And basically, you heard it here, long story short, about two or more hours a week of artistic or creative activity is associated with good mental health. Uh, so I'd encourage you to kind of tuck that one away. So Hippocrates is the father of modern medicine. He was the first guy to say we should do a structured history and examination. He's quoted as saying, cure sometimes, treat often, comfort always. So he knew, even back then, the difference between curing and treating, or healing in my terms. So whereas curing is the eradication of disease, and that's been our a uh, very blinkered focus in Western medicine and the scientific method. Healing is about getting the person to the best place they can be, psychologically and physically, given the hand of cards they've been dealt. I was watching an episode of Star Trek uh, once, and it was the Star Trek Next Generation, and they'd been down to a planet and been captured. And the aliens say of Dr. Beverly Crusher, she seems to be the elected healer in their species. And that really struck a chord with me to say, well, yes, those of us who choose to go into the health professions are electing to be the healers in our society. Um, and so my question of you, or my challenge of you, is what kind of doctor will you be? And I'm not talking about anaesthetist, colorectal surgeon, epidemiologist, GP. Will you be a health technocrat? hiding behind a white coat, using big words that patients don't understand. Master of the universe, I'm really important. What matters is me. Will you be a pen? Sadly, the pharmaceutical companies and an awful lot of the public see us as the gateway to a medication. We've structured our health system, particularly in primary care, towards an acute intervention with a pharmacological outcome. And yet there's growing evidence that for chronic illness, um, a number of preventative practices are as effective, but they're a lot more time consuming and we haven't structured a health system to be able to use them. Or will you be a healer? I have a colleague, Dominic Spaniolo, who's a histopathologist, hasn't seen a patient in 30 years, but I regard him as a healer because I know the care that he takes in his lymphoma subtype diagnosis is driven by achieving the right outcome for the patient. Tomatoes. It's said that knowledge is knowing tomato is a fruit, wisdom is not putting it in the fruit salad. 
What are the take-homes? Firstly, I'd say, and I'd echo what Chris said earlier, understand and become yourself. It takes time. I'm still learning about myself. Don't be afraid to be a human first and a doctor second in your practice. Don't be afraid to show your humanity. There's two people in a room, somebody who's sick and somebody with expertise who wants to help, but it's two people. Um, a good piece of advice I got as a young registrar was don't take shortcuts in your clinical practice. Otherwise, you won't be able to sleep at night. If you do your work diligently, you're examining a chest. If you don't examine the front, you'll miss the upper lobes. If you don't examine the back, you'll miss posterior lobe pathology. Do your job properly so that you can go home and sleep at night. Thirdly, thinking back to Roy and my discussion with him, listen to our patients. Respect them their right to choose how they want to handle their illness uh, and also their wisdom. Um, finally, I would say one of the things I've learned from Solaris Care, which I wish I'd known as a medical student, is that just by sitting and listening, you are doing a therapeutic intervention. One of our best meet and greet staff in Solaris was a retired professor of chemistry who was just a really good listener. And if I'd known how much benefit people derive in psychobabble from having their story validated, then I would have been much happier in my role as a student, so you can help. You will find it very difficult over the years, but I encourage you, as a final word, always to try and find ways to show that you care. Thanks for your attention. Thank you so much for that, David. That's the second time I've heard you speak and it's reinforced for me and I hope for everyone else in the audience how important it is to hold on to our humanity as doctors. We don't have very much time for questions at all, Sorry so I thought, <laughs> no, thank you. I thought I would ask a practical question. Where would you advise medical students now or when we become practitioners to look into complementary therapies to best help our patients? Um, so there are, there are different domains of complementary alternative medicine. The, the herbal oral stuff, the Memorial Sloan Kettering have a fantastic website called Herbs in Medicine or something like that, um, where you can look up individual herbs. Um, there are now journals of complementary medicine. I'm on the editorial board of one of them. Um, most uh, many patients will go to the internet and as we all know there are some very dubious sources of knowledge on the internet. Um, I have in my consulting room a book uh, written by Mark Braun and Leslie Cohen um, which is called, um, it's a summary of all the side effects of all the herbal preparations. There are a lot of interactions. Um, I'm occasionally referred patients by other haematologists saying, can you talk to this patient about what they're taking and make sure that common sense prevails. Um, but there is an awful lot of information out there and a lot of patients will come in with very fixed beliefs of their own. And our challenge as a therapeutic person, as a healer, is to find a way of establishing enough common ground to proceed in some way together. I haven't really answered your question, but um, the problem is, for those of us in any branch of medicine, I think somebody recently calculated if you wanted to keep up with knowledge in haematology, you would need to read 29 hours a day. So there's so much happening now uh, for those who are training in subspecialties with all of the molecular biology and all the new things that are happening that it's becoming very difficult to keep up with mainstream medicine. If you make a decision, as I did, to buy into this other stuff, well, that's a whole new lot of work that most of us don't have time for or commitment to do. So one of the things we're trying to do more and more is distill what's good and bad out there. Um, and if I have a patient that's referred to me as taking shark cartilage, I will say, look, according to what I've read and seen, I don't think it's going to work because the body doesn't absorb it. Um, and so by showing an open mind, you can usually establish enough of a bridgehead on the two belief systems between you to find enough common ground and keep going. 
Thank you again, everyone. Can you join me in thanking David for his time today?